Um, it's a pleasure to be here in Krakow again. Uh, I'd like to thank Vitaly and the organizers for the invitation to speak. My last visit here was 40 years ago, 1976. Most of you were not born. And the Vavel and the Square uh, were covered in gritty pollution from large diesel fumes. Uh, it was a very different environment. I'm delighted to, to be back here now representing the Stanford School of Engineering and to see very interesting, cool, hot, rapid growth technology startups from Polish universities, Polish startups here on the floors. Um, I've actually have not come from Silicon Valley. I just came in from Graz, Austria, where I've spent the last two and a half weeks working with the Technical University of Graz with the rector, but also local government, local companies, startups, looking at the startup and innovation ecosystem in Austria and offering recommendations uh, from the university level all the way up to the Bundesland, the Steiermark level, and even to the Austrian national government level about new initiatives, ideas, activities they could jumpstart around innovation and entrepreneurship. What I'm going to talk about today uh, on the, as the introduction of this panel on uh, startups and corporations is a little bit of what's happening in Silicon Valley, but much more about what's happening in Europe. Because in my experience and what I've seen on the ground working in Germany and Austria and in Norway in recent months, for example, there's a lot of growing momentum around corporate startup relationships that's really interesting for you to be paying attention to. And if you look at this slide here, so in early June in Berlin, just 10 days ago, the Startup Europe Partnership and Nesta, along with other organizations, had an award ceremony with an award for the top 25 corporate startup stars in 2016. You'll see some very familiar names, a few US companies such as Cisco, but these are primarily European companies. Uh, you'll see very heavily telecom, banking. These companies have been recognized uh, for their activity in working with startups here in Europe uh, in many different sectors, services, finance, banking, for example, a little bit of manufacturing, some software. Here in Europe, things are beginning to pick up around the corporate startup relationship. And actually, I think this is much more useful for you as Polish entrepreneurs and managers and leaders, CEOs. I think you should be focusing much more on what's happening on the European startup corporate relationship scene today than just on Silicon Valley and the United States. Um, just to point to some examples of what some of the top corporates are doing today, Cisco Europe, for example, has a major investment fund of several billion dollars investing in startups and an entrepreneurs in residence program uh, aimed at working with startups and bringing startups uh, out of various companies and environments in Europe. Rabobank, an online platform to connect entrepreneurs along with investors and, and other startups. Unilever in the food space, if you think 100 pilot projects with startups focused on various product lines, research and development projects, but also investing directly in startups and projects as well. The broad trends here that are interesting on the European scene is that we're seeing the numbers of industries engaged in corporate startup connections expanding to include interesting new, new types of industries which have not been involved today. I'm gonna to say a little bit more about what's happening in the Aust Austrian automotive sector in terms of corporate startup relationships. But one third of accelerator programs in Europe today, all across Europe, are supported, uh, have direct engagement with European corporates. And I invite you to download this study done by Nesta in the UK, which will give you a lot of additional detail on what's happening on the European corporate startup scene. Some very good information also about how European corporates are managing and experimenting with corporate uh, startup relationships. These are some of the reasons and engagement models that European corporates are using in how they engage with startups. Direct investment, mentoring, coaching startups, entrepreneurship programs, and competitions, prize programs, where they're sponsoring prizes, and they get a chance to look at many, many teams uh, in a specific challenge area, specific technology area, where they can identify potential suppliers of new technologies or potential acquisition targets. Now, why do Silicon Valley companies typically get engaged uh, with startups? Some of the major corporates in the Valley, going back to the dot-com days, particularly Cisco, for example, uh, at its peak was acquiring 50 to 60 companies a year, 1998, 1999, 2000, and integrating those on an ongoing basis into a very rapidly growing corporate operation. 
Today, Valley corporations look at startups as a major way to outsource research and development as a risk reduction effort. They let startups go off and explore new markets when they get to a certain critical size. If the market looks strategic, they go in and look at buying it or developing a vendor relationship. Aqua hires, startups are a very good way of bringing in an entire engineering sales marketing team around a specific emerging growth area, looking for new suppliers and vendors, for example, and cutting edge technologies. Some companies, corporates, look at startups as a way to jumpstart, refresh old, outdated corporate cultures. This is increasingly a big problem in many European companies where the very old traditional hierarchical style of management is simply no longer working. You see this in many family-owned companies, for example. And then, of course, in a negative sense, sometimes acquisitions are made of startups to block competition to make sure that your competition doesn't get a particular technology. Uh, I'm not gonna go over this entire chart, this is from the Nesta study. I just invite you to look at the top categories in terms of what are the four major objectives that corporates use when they engage with startups. One is to rejuvenate corporate culture. Two, innovate big brands. Bring new product ideas, bring new branding, bring new sales and marketing channels, for example. Solve business problems quicker and faster through new technology, new business models. And then finally, expand into future markets through new technology acquisitions, or into new fast growth markets that have been marginal to the core business. And the reason, if you look on the left-hand side, the common way that, these are some of the, the five common areas that corporates use, so there are many different approaches you can use, include uh, one-off events. This is where you see the business plan competitions, the prizes, for example, where an SAP or another large European corporate might come in as a, an event sponsor. That's very low risk. Sharing resources, Microsoft was very famous for its BizSpark program, where they simply made available uh, on a low cost, low risk basis, uh, Microsoft tools to tens of thousands of companies around the world. Business support, uh, establishing an incubator accelerator within the corporation where startups come in who have a common aligned interest with a major corporate entity. Partnerships, investments, you'll hear more about corporate venturing uh, throughout the panel and throughout the theme of this conference, and of course, ultimately, acquisitions. If you think about the broad landscape of how startups engage with corporates, this is a very good map, because down here on the left, you have the limited resource commitment. On the far right, the substantial resource commitment by corporates. On the vertical axis, all the way from substantial resource commitment by startups, down to limited resource commitment. And generally, corporates who are aiming at a long-term strategy with low-risk approaches start with the competitions, free tools, and then eventually want to find their way up to acquisitions. This is a big challenge in many European corporations today, particularly where you're dealing maybe with family-owned companies that have very entrenched, very rigid management styles and hierarchies. So let me give you an example of what's happening today in the Austrian automotive sector from one of Austria's leading uh, companies, electronic software company that's providing test equipment, test solutions to automotive teams, corporations around the world. This is a company I interviewed just last week in Graz. It is a family-owned firm in the Steiermark region, 3,500 local employees, 1.4 billion revenues. It's a very well-established business built out of the Graz region. It's a spin-off from the Technical University originally. Very thin senior management team. I walked into the senior management suite. It's about 10 offices. You know, when you think about maybe 20 people man max managing this entire corporation of 3,500 people locally, 8,000 globally, it's a very thin management team in which to pull off M&A and these types of uh, engagements with startups. So in the past two years, they've acquired four companies, two in Austria, two in Germany, two software, and two electronics sensor systems around safety and autonomous vehicles, autonomous driving, for example. Why did they do this? These were companies that were working in strategic areas that the main corporation did not have experience in, that they could not develop themselves. A couple of these companies actually were small firms that approached the large corporate essentially for an umbrella agreement. They wanted to come in. They didn't want to have to deal with fundraising. They didn't want to have to deal with sales, marketing, customer support, but they brought in a great tactical idea, a mature technology, and so they worked out a deal and they brought the entire team in-house. These transactions typically are not done through investment bankers. This is where the corporate is basically 
running its own finance models with its own financial analyst team. They have enough cash in the bank where they can do direct purchase of these companies without going through investment banks. So these, these transactions tend to be under the radar. They're not captured by a lot of the investment banking reporting that you see going on. Oftentimes the governments or even the economic development organizations don't know what's happening. So a lot of what's going on simply is never captured by the statistics or what you read about in the press. And again, this came, these purchases came entirely from firm bank accounts with the value all the way from 7 million euros up to 250 million euros. So a very wide range in size. We're beginning to see more family-owned corporations follow this example in Germany, Austria, across Europe. Uh, it's a very interesting trend, and I think this is, in some ways, much more relevant for those of you in the audience who are interested in the corporate startup relationship than perhaps looking to Silicon Valley and the experience of some of our larger corporates. Let me say a few words about digitalization. So we've just wrapped up the Industry 4.0 panel. Unfortunately, I do not speak Polish, so I don't know what the panel said, but let, let me give you my own two cents because I've spent a lot of time in Austria and Germany lately uh, addressing this issue of Industry 4.0. And I'll tell you what I've told the Germans and the Austrians. <clears throat> I believed in Sri and Fear Point Zero. It's a worthwhile program, but it's not a national software strategy. And it's not a national strategy which aims at changing digital culture inside companies. It's purely technology development. And what the Germans are missing is that digitalization, shift to faster digital-driven uh, business models, technologies, companies is not just about technology, it's about culture change up and down the company from the lowest team all the way up to the CEO and the board. This is what Industry 4.0 does not do. And I believe the neglect of the company culture change issue is a fundamental gap in Industry 4.0 and in the German and in many European countries' approaches to digitalization. So there is insufficient focus on software and data, but also this culture change also, there's a fundamental different point of view between Silicon Valley and Europe, especially Germany, Austria, Switzerland, other countries, as to what we think is the technical high ground for the future. The answer out of Germany is manufacturing with a little extra IT, maybe a little bit, bit of extra artificial intelligence put into smart factories. We don't think that's really the strategic high ground. We think the strategic high ground is artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, machine learning, going into smartphones, medical systems, military security systems, transportation systems, but also factory systems. So from our point of view, AI is really the continuation of our focus in the Valley uh, and on the West Coast of software being the core value added, being the source of major profits, being the source of major new job creation. This is a very fundamental difference in the view from Europe, Germany, and Silicon Valley. So how can all this experience from your benefit Polish and Central Eastern European companies? Well, first of all, as I mentioned, I think the experience of the mid-sized European companies, family-owned companies, is probably much more relevant to the environment you see here than continually looking at Cisco, IBM, Google, Facebook in general. The difficulty here is that much of this activity around the mid-sized and large acquisitions and startup engagements here in Europe is simply not being tracked on a regular basis, so it's very hard to know exactly what, what these companies are doing. This is where it's important to build out personal relationships with these companies and go talk to these companies and get to know the board people directly. Great, great news is that as more of these mid-sized companies, family-owned companies are becoming engaged, I think we'll see a bigger market for Polish technology companies not going into the IBMs, Googles, GEs, for example, but being purchased by other European larger and mid-sized corporations. That would be a big boost here in Europe where M&A traditionally has been quite low. That will increase over the medium term the value of Polish companies and companies all across Europe. And also, I think eventually, there's going to be an opening up of this idea that all innovation has to take place inside the corporation to bigger, uh, expectations, understanding that a lot of innovation can be purchased, that it's more valid and useful to begin outsourcing innovation to the, to the new small startups uh, all across Poland and Central Eastern Europe. So that said, do not underestimate the difficulty of transitioning traditional company cultures 
to digital cultures, to new software and data-centric cultures. This is a big challenge for many, many companies in Europe, whether they're family-owned or sold and traded on the stock markets. So this is where you need to rethink decision-making, communications channels, how you engage with new sources of startup, how you build your ecosystem around you. This requires a fundamental rethinking. Uh, part of my concern here is that we simply do not see enough business cases being produced by European business schools of European corporates successfully making this transition, moving to startup-oriented uh, outsourcing of innovation. So it's very difficult to understand what's happening and then learn from recent experience of other corporations here. This is where I think we need to see far more business schools uh, producing case studies around real examples of what actual companies are doing uh, because that will help each of you understand where things are headed and what lessons can be learned from past successes and past failures around how corporates work with startups. So thank you very much.